Okay, I'd like to welcome everyone to the November Atlanta Metro chapter of the Georgia Society of Professional Engineers uh, presentation. Uh, this month, I am pleased to present our speaker, uh, Dr. Shuming Ni, who is uh, the Granger Distinguished Chair in Engineering at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and uh, also a personal family friend. So uh, with that, uh, I hope everybody enjoys a, a very informative presentation on some new applications of biomedical nanotechnology and surgery. So with that, Shemin, it's all you. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, before I start, I'd like to especially thank uh, Stephen Ray as well as uh, Roger Grapman for the kind invitation. It's a truly pleasure uh, to speak, to have this opportunity to, to speak to the Georgia Professional Engineers Society. And uh, I, I was actually uh, on the Emory University faculty for 15 years, uh, just a few years ago that I moved my laboratory to the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. And, uh, you know, uh, Steve will know that uh, our, our permanent home is still in Atlanta, Georgia, and I travel quite frequently between Illinois and uh, Atlanta. So, uh, it's, again, uh, thank you for the invitation. It's a, a, a great opportunity today to share uh, with you some of our work in developing engineering technologies for uh, surgery, uh, especially for surgical navigation and guidance. And I'll show that uh, our long-term goal, you know, we've been working on this uh, topic for the last uh, almost 20 years. Our long-term goal is to develop a very much like GPS-like hardware as well as a Google Map software for uh, guiding uh, surgery, especially under minimally invasive conditions, as you will learn more that we don't have to open the body anymore. We can do a lot of the surgical procedures under minimally uh, invasive conditions. So uh, let, me, let me start by uh, raise the, uh, the question, uh, uh, about a surgeon's uh, in challenge. Okay. So a major challenge facing the surgeon is that whenever you open the body, and it's quite complex. I think you see my cursor here. So all of these bloody st structures, you know, uh, in, a, in an anatomy diagram, they, they, the, our body looks great, but actually when you open it up, it's quite uh, complicated. So you see another photo, and you know, all of these kind of structures, and you're trying to identify a particular piece, a uh, tumor lesion, or some other things that you would like to resect, remove, and you have to remove that very accurately. So the complexity of the anatomy, as well as the uh, tissues, organs, uh, really presents a huge, a major challenge to the surgeon. And you have to be very careful uh, judgment and experience uh, becoming very important for a surgeon because if you accidentally cut a, a, a nerve, then that's a major problem. Or if you accidentally cut a, a, a large blood vessel, that's also a big problem, okay? So the goal in surgery is that you want to remove the lesion, for example, a solid tumor as completely as possible but at the same time, you want to preserve the healthy tissues and the, uh, the functions of the body as much as possible. So if I go to here, you see that, well, you know, uh, my uh, surgical colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania and also at Emory University Hospital often say that they really have only two tools that they are born with. Okay, one is their hands. Okay, you can see that the surgeons often use their hands for uh, touching, for feeling the texture, the hardness, uh, the hardness, you know, elasticity of the tissue. So that, that gives them quite a bit of insight whether a 
uh, a piece of tissue is healthy or it's a, it's a tumor. And the other thing of her tool they have is their eyes, okay? They can look at it and some of them do smell the tissues, but that's not quite often. So overall, you see that these people looking at all of this table, they're really a limited tool. I think engineering, really technologies, is now providing all of the advanced uh, tools that, uh, that we believe have already changed the field of medical surgery. And the, again, the challenges in cancer surgery, more specifically, are the following. The first is the surgical margins. So how do you know you have to cut the tumor out? The margin is negative. That means that the surgical boundaries is clear of the tumor cells, okay? And the other is how do you know you have cut everything out? Uh, how do you know you have not leave anything behind? Any residual uh, satellite tumors uh, which might stay uh, uh, behind and, and would cause a problem for the tumor to uh, to grow back, and that is the phenomenon called reoccurrence. Actually, even at this time, about uh, one third of the uh, patients would come back for another surgery or other treatment because the reoccurrence of the tumor, okay? And uh, also very importantly, especially clinically, some of the lymph nodes. How do you know whether some of the lymph nodes are benign or they are metastatic? Uh, meaning that there are positive lymph nodes that contains metastases, to, to contain small tumors spread into the lymph node. And uh, I'm uh, using one example. And here you can see it's a pig lung, okay? And I actually got this from Augusta, Georgia. So they have a slaughterhouse there, and they're very happy to provide us these lungs for free because no one really in Georgia eat these things, okay? It's an excellent specimen for our scientific research. And we purposely embed or we implant a piece of tumor into this pig lung. If you look at the uh, bright field picture here, it's really hard to see where that little piece is, okay? So uh, remember that we're trying to rem uh, remove some of even smallest tumors on the order of a millimeter or sub-millimeter, okay? So in a kind of bloody seeing uh, tissue like this, it's very hard to determine uh, with any confidence where the tumor might be. However, if we have a way to tag the tumor so that the tumor, make the tumor glow, Okay, so then we can turn off the room light and use a handheld illumination uh, lamp. Okay? Then we illuminate the tissue and the tumor that we implanted that would glow there. So therefore, we realize that if we can make a tumor glow, okay, and then it would be very easy for the surgeon to recognize the tumor. So it can make a resection. And if the resection is not complete, you can, make, you can make another resection. So it's really going to provide a beacon type of uh, uh, a signal for the surgeons to determine where the tumors and also uh, determine whether that tumor has been completely removed. So uh, this is one example actually it's an image guided surgery of a pancreatic tumor patient that my colleague, uh, David Kuby, operated at Emory University Hospital, okay? And uh, this is a huge pancreatic tumor. So Dr. Kuby, uh, first he, he operated on this patient, he actually cut through the tumor. If you look at it, it's a elongated tumor. He actually cut through it and without knowing that, okay? So uh, he left behind a small piece of the tumor right here. So through our technology, we can measure whether there are tumor cells because the tumor cell would be glowing, would be emitting light. So all we need is to use optical imaging or optical spectroscopy uh, to uh, uh, evaluate the margins here. Therefore, we would know there are still residue tumor cells. Uh, and in this particular case, 
uh, uh, Dr. Lakubi indeed cut through the tumor and left an, a piece behind. Okay? So uh, I, I often really like to work with surgeons because they have very similar mentalities. They're actually oriented. So for Dr. Kubi, uh, once he found the results from our measurement, he did not ask too many questions. He went back to the surgical room. He cut another piece out, this smaller piece. This time, it's a clean cut. It's negative margins, okay? So uh, another uh, example is in brain tumors. You know, for the brain tumors, they call gliomas, uh, especially the primary uh, brain tumors, it's very difficult to treat. It's because they have this kind of uh, uh, roots structure. They infiltrate uh, into the brain. So there's no clear capsule or clear boundary, and you can determine. So it's always like roots goes deeply into the brain. Okay, so therefore it's becoming especially important that you have a engineering technology which can determine which part of the brain, which part of the tissue contains tumor cell, which part does not contain, okay? So especially in the brain, you want to preserve as much of the brain tissue as possible because otherwise you could affect speech, it could affect memory, and the person cannot walk anymore. So uh, my collaborator, Kostas uh, Hadzapanias uh, also was at Emory University and he uh, was recruited to Mount Sinai Hospital uh, in New York City. He is the chair of the neurosurgery department. And we're still collaborating. And in our engineering work, uh, we developed a number of things. Uh, the first thing is called the handheld spectroscopic device. It's called, I, I call the spectral paint. Emory University actually uh, trademark that spectral paint is, is a trademark. It's uh, very much like a, a large size the ball pen with uh, uh, optical fibers inside, and the surgeon can hold this pen during surgery, scanning the surgical cavity, looking for any residue tumors, anything that has been missed. Okay, and it's, it has very high sensitivity and allows even a microscopic tumor or satellite tumor to be identified for surgical resection. And uh, after that, we developed this integrated multi-channel system for image-guided surgery. It has the anatomic color channel, has a near-infrared laser, has the spectroscopy, which is the uh, 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 which is the wavelength, you know, dispersed uh, intensity. And through software, we uh, produce a composite uh, image. So as I said that our goal is to, through this hardware and software, we produce a GPS type of system with Google Map so that can uh, show a color map of the anatomy of the body to guide the surgeons and also guide the robots in the future. And uh, we started this about uh, 12 years ago, in 2008, uh, by a student in my laboratory, Mike Mancini, and he just bought some of the component from Home Depot, he said, to build this prototype. It, it looks very kind of uh, you know, primitive, but it's cheap, it's working, okay? And several cameras here, this is the hardware. So after 10 years, I need to, emphasize that it does take a lot of time, okay? From the prototyping to a almost a finished product. So it took about 10 years, it just about last year, we developed this uh, uh, commercial system, okay? It looks much better here. And the company donated a system worth about half a million dollars for this one in my laboratory. And you can see that, uh, we, we can now, uh, with this almost commercial system, do both the research and the clinical applications. And uh, also there's a UIUC, University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, University of Pennsylvania, and the Nigerian University team for clinical translations. And it's moving forward uh, at both the University of Pennsylvania and at Nanjing, a hospital uh, in Nanjing for, uh, for clinical applications.
And uh, I will show you that, you know, some of the hardware, the engineering aspect, we can do pretty well, okay? And in my opinion, what's really the bottleneck for developing this ultimate GPS and Google Map system for guiding surgery are the tracers and the contrast agent. Uh, the tracers, the contrast agent, are the agents that you inject into the blood, into the body, so uh, to highlight the tumor. So the tumor would glow, make the tumor glow because we inject some of these tracers into the body. And these tracers would recognize the tumor, get accumulated in the tumor. So therefore you see much brighter signal of the tracers in the tumor, okay? So if you inject anything uh, in vivo into the body, is almost considered to be a therapeutic drug. So you have to go through essentially the same FDA protocol to get it approved. Mm -hmm. So, so far, I think this is really a bottleneck. And uh, currently there are only uh, maybe two to three agents approved. They're old agent, but there are some uh, new batches. That it's quite a number of new generations of targeted uh, uh, tracers in the pipeline. So we're very optimistic that uh, in the next uh, a couple of years, uh, uh, you will see a, a emergence of some of the new tracers coming up for clinical applications. I would like to, to highlight the, the old fashioned uh, dye called indocyanin grit, which is a near infrared dye. You excite at 785 nanometer in the near infrared and also emit in the uh, near infrared. So when this dye is injected into the bloodstream, it bounds to the blood proteins, especially albumins and lipoproteins very quickly. So it form a nanoparticle complex. And this nanoparticle complex get accumulated in the tumors through a effect is called the EPR effect. And EPR stands for enhanced permeability and retention. So it's the enhanced permeability and retention. Essentially, it says that the vasculatures, the capillaries, the blood capillaries in the tumor are, are leaky. Okay, they leak. And it's because that the tumor grows so fast, it does not have enough time to perfect the, the blood vessels. So the tumor blood vessels have these kind of uh, nano-sized holes. So therefore, this dye protein complex can leak out of the blood vessel, get accumulated. And the retention is due to the higher pressure inside solid tumors collapse the lymphatic vessels. As you know that the blood vessels supplies the blood, of course. The lymphatic vessels actually have a negative pressure and there are the vacuum holes that drain away any of the uh, waste, excess fluid, okay? Uh, but in the solid tumors, the pressure is actually higher than the outside. So therefore, the vacuum holes, the lymphatic vessels get, you know, uh, uh, collapsed. Because it's collapsed, it cannot function anymore. It cannot drain away any of the, uh, 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 the, uh, the tracers that get accumulated there. So therefore it's going to stay in the tumor for quite some time. And the other question is that why you want to use this longer wavelength, you know, near infrared, about 780 to 800, is because that the penetration, because of the interference, if you use visible light, you know, the blood is red, you know, these things is going to interfere with the tumor signal. So if you go to the near infrared, uh -huh, and you can avoid some of the uh, you know, interference. And also, as you go to a longer wavelength, <clears throat> the light can penetrate uh, the tissues a little bit better than in the visible. So this ICG, indocyanin green, and uh, now it's being widely used in image guided surgery, but it does not really have the so-called molecular targeting capability. It just get accumulated in the tumors through the leaky vasculature, as well as retained in the tumor through the collapsed lymphatic vessels. And another agent 
which was uh, uh, approved by the FDA, essentially through uh, our, our collaborators' work uh, at Emory University, is called 5 amino levulinic acid, or ALA. It's a small molecule, but it is a, 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 a cofactor in the biosynthesis of hemoglobin. Hemoglobin, of course, you know, it's the red, it's the part in the red blood cell that bonds to oxygen, okay? The interesting thing is that because the tumor cell grows so fast, uh, they are metabolically more active than the normal cell. So they take up this ALA, this uh, amino levulinic acid, much more efficiently than the normal cell. Okay, and the, uh, uh, this small molecule, uh, it, once it's being taken up to the tumor cell or normal cell too, uh, will stimulate the biosynthesis of the protoporphyrin 9, which is the precursor for the heme. Okay, and it turned out that uh, this protoporphyrin uh, need to be converted to the heme through an enzyme that can to put an iron atom in the center. And it turns out that most of the tumor cells don't have that enzyme. So therefore you get a accumulation of this protoporphyrin 9 precursor in the tumor cell. Okay, And so therefore that highlight the tumor boundaries. So these two kind of tracers works on, uh, with very different principles. You know, this is completely a passive agent which get accumulated outside the cell. So it's called extracellular, whereas the amino levulinic acid is intracellular. It's getting metabolized inside the tumor cell. So it's an active or metabolic agent. Both of them work really well. And the ALA uh, uh, works especially well for visualizing brain tumors for guiding surgery. And there has been quite a bit of work in developing uh, called a smart or activatable fluorescent probes so that the particles would be dark, okay? It would be inactive or silent when they are circulating in the bloodstream, but they would be activated to emit light when they get accumulated in the tumor. So for example, if we encapsulate the endocyne green into nanoparticles, that's where my nanotechnology expertise comes in, Okay, and the endocyne green uh, going to quench itself. Okay, you can see that this is the nanoparticles endocyne green is it, going to quench itself. It stays roughly, uh, roughly dark, and when it's activated by enzyme in the tumor, and it's going to release the endocyne green. Suddenly, you turn it on. Okay, so that would be wonderful because the uh, ICG would only be active when it gets uh, uh, into the tumor or stays dark when it's circulating in the blood. So therefore you gain additional contrast, the differences between the, the blood, the normal tissue and the tumor. And the other thing I, I uh, have to mention is that it's, it's just a project I've been working on ever since I was a graduate student at Northwestern University is the development of this surface enhanced RAMA called the SERS nanoparticles as a new generation of contrast agent for tumor imaging and also for uh, guiding surgery, okay? The idea is that you will have a metallic a gold nanoparticle. As you know that gold is a conductor. It has a lot of free electrons. Okay, and when you excite this gold with a light beam, you know, light is a electromagnetic field and it can uh, excite the electrons, uh, 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 the, the electric field going to move the electrons. And if the incoming light frequency is in resonance with the intrinsic like, frequency oscillation of the electrons, you have a, a, a plasma resonance effect, okay? And that effect amplifies the electromagnetic field strength on the particle surface dramatically, okay? And so therefore, this gold, colloidal gold in the center 
is very much like a metallic antenna that accumulated, amplify the signals on, on the surface. So, <clears throat> so if you found a way, you can tack these kind of uh, uh, gold nanoparticles on the circuit uh, on the surface with the molecules with certain signatures. Then you can amplify. Uh, you know, the signature molecule on the surface. Of course, to make this particle uh, compatible work in the body, you have to use a polymer entirely encapsulate, camouflage the particle. It's often a polyethylene glycol. It's a biocompatible camouflaging event. Then on the outside surface here, you can have some of the antibodies, or, or, or a small molecule, uh, you know, people call ligands, that can recognize the receptors on the tumor cell. So essentially that the center here is the amplifying antenna, and the surface here is the spectroscopic signature, and the circle here is the camouflaging, and the outer uh, part here is the targeting uh, agent. Okay, so it, it sounds very complicated. Uh, we've been working on this for more than 20 years and we can actually make this work really well. So we start with the gold antenna and we put these spectroscopic signatures and then we put the camouflaging uh, uh, coating. And of course, the last step is we put the targeting agent on the surface and we can actually do this very, very well. I, I must say that you know, it, it started from my graduate work at Northwestern. Uh, I, I believe that you probably don't know that I um, was, uh, was a student with uh, Professor Richard uh, P. Van Dyne, and he published his, uh, his, his famous paper in 1977, and unfortunately he passed away uh, last year, and I wrote a uh, uh, a memorial article in honor of him that was published in the uh, in the American Chemical Society journal ACS Nano. So this was uh, uh, 1977, and in this paper, Professor Van Dyne reported that by uh, absorbing some of the spectroscopic signatures, like the palm tree here, okay, on this antenna, metallic nanoparticle antenna. Uh, the optical signals of that signature can be amplified by a million fold. Okay, that was a really big deal. It got the Air Force, uh, the Navy, all excited for the military applications. And uh, when I became a, a assistant professor first at Indiana University, and exactly 20 years later in 1997, and with my first graduate student, Stephen Emery, spelled exactly the same Emory, okay? But he has no connection with Emory University. And we published a paper in the magazine of science, okay? See that probing single molecules and single nanoparticles by surface in hand Rama scattered. So for, for uh, 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 you know, I, 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 those old days, it's often only a couple of authors. So it's me and my student. And now it's very collaborative. You will see that we work with a large group of people, engineers, scientists, uh, computing experts, and clinicians. So in this paper 20 years later, we found that, well, the intrinsic or the fundamental enhancement factor is much, much more than a million fold, okay? The, this antenna can amplify the signals, the intrinsic or the fundamental effect is much more than a million fold. Actually, it's 10 to the 14th. 10 to the 12th is a trillion. So 10 to the 14th is 120. So that made Van Dyne, uh, Professor Van Dyne, really happy because it's essentially positioned him for the Nobel Prize if it's ever happened, okay? So then immediately the question is that who was wrong or all of us were correct? Was Van Dyne wrong in publishing that a million fold enhancement or we were wrong 
okay, with Stevie Emery he, uh, publishing this work showing 100 trillion fold enhancement. It turned out that, okay, it requires a famous professor at Columbia University, Louise Bruce, okay, and uh, he published a paper two years later and us demonstrated everything that we're all correct, okay. Uh, the uh, explanation eventually we all realized that Professor Van Dyne measured the population average of the effect, something like the average household income in the United States, something like you know sixty-five thousand dollars. Okay, so he measured the average uh, uh, enhancement effect, which is a million fold. Whereas in our work, okay, we actually identified Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, so we measured the individual the possible highest possible individual effect okay that means that you know uh warren buffett and and, and bill gates um, more or less on the on the billing okay so eventually uh, all of us are correct so the question is how do we put these things into uh, into medical or some of the the clinical and and the military applications. So we're still working on some of the things. We can make these things really, really great. So each of these dots is actually a tiny little nanoparticle, okay? Give beautiful signals. They're very uniform. And before uh, Professor Van Dyne passed away, he was the leading PI of a Air Force large grant that I, I was part of that. We're trying to develop this uh, 100 trillion enhancement effect for uh, detection of terrorists, okay? So we argue that even one particle is enough to detect a terrorist with 100, 100 trillion fold enhancement, okay? Shimun, we have a question from the field. Yes. Um, and this is uh, from Bob Harbert, who uh, is also a professor, by the way. Uh, he's asking, uh, well, basically, he first says SCRS has a huge enhancement of uh, Raman scattering in lab environments. So his question is, does that lead to background scattering interference in its use in clinical settings? Well, uh, there are a number of challenges for clinical settings for biomedical applications. So one is the biocompatibility. And by using the biocompatible polymer coating, we believe we overcome that. And uh, actually, in our case, uh, we minimize the background. You can see that even the individual nanoparticles, these are the gold nanoparticles, very little background. So, so uh, we have you know, minimized that as well. And by shifting the laser wavelength to the near infrared, in the visible, you do see quite a bit of background, but going to the infrared, and we're able to minimize that as well. Uh, there's still a long uh, way to, to really uh, to get these nanoparticles by the FDA, uh, to, 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 to get these particles approved by the FDA, but uh, that's going to be a, a major challenge in going forward, okay? So uh, these are some of the technologies that we have developed, uh, but so now I like to focus a little bit uh, on the clinical application. So my uh, long-term collaborator is Dr. Sunil Single. He's the thoracic surgeon at University of Pennsylvania. We actually started to work on this when he was at Emory University and he returned to the University of Pennsylvania, but we continue the application. And even now, we still work together. And he, he's a lung, he's a heart and lung surgeon, fascinating person, it's a, it's, a, it's a star in the country. He has the largest, most productive research group in image-guided surgery in the country. And uh, immediately we move on to uh, large animals, large animals, we're not talking about horses or cows, okay? Especially in Illinois, people hear about large animals, they often uh, think about the farm animals like cows, you know, uh, horses. No, the large animals we, we, we are talking about here are mainly the household dogs, uh, canines, especially 
household pets because these dogs live with the uh, uh, family, okay, and uh, often eat some of the things, you know, and they're excellent models for the human humor. The dogs would naturally uh, develop humors uh, the same way as humans. So therefore, we did our image-guided surgical research on this uh, naturally occurring lung tumors in animals. You can see that that's the, this is the open chest uh, in a surgery, okay? And uh, immediately, you see that this is the lobe of the lung, and that's a tumor here. So through our imaging, uh, we are able to identify the boundaries very well. Okay. So interestingly, that, that uh, uh, the dogs, uh, when you found uh, uh, diagnosed tumors, is almost always late stage because the dog really cannot tell the owners, tell the people uh, what do they feel, that kind of thing. So you see, that's just a huge, it's, it's, it's a big tumor. Okay. And uh, again, by uh, optical imaging, uh, we're able to map the uh, lung tumor very accurately. We know exactly where would it, would it, uh, 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 the boundaries would be. So it's, it's starting to look like a Google map, okay? And uh, with uh, the success in dogs, we move very quickly to, uh, to human uh, lung cancer patients. So operated, uh, led by Professor uh, Sunil Singo at University of Pennsylvania. And you can see that's the, uh, the, the lung cancer. This is the cat, the uh, computed axial tomography that we do this all the time. There's clear air nodule and it's, uh, uh, it's verified by metabolic uh, imaging by using PET. PET is positron, it's, posi it's a electron, but it has positive charge. So it's called positron emission tomography, okay? And tomography, of course, is that you map the three-dimensional structure. And this is the bright field, okay? And this is the fluorescence. This is the optical imaging. So they are strongly correlated. So we have to make sure that our optical imaging technology is correlated with the traditional uh, uh, imaging modalities such as X-ray, PET, and MRI. So this is another neoplasm you see that the optical signal is strongly correlated with other technologies. And this is the third patient is correlated as well, okay? So with this kind of clinical correlation, then uh, we move forward uh, to a large human, cl uh, human clinical trial. I just want to demonstrate a few examples. And uh, the first one is a massive tumor. This is the open chest surgery. You can see that the entire thing here is the tumor tissue. If you look at the fluorescence in situ, in situ, of course, is right there in place. It's inside the chest, right there, there in the body. You see the optical signals corresponds to the huge tumor inside the chest. If you can remove the, the lung, okay, and exhale, you know, release the air, it collapses a little bit, it looks like this. Then you look at the ex vivo, like ex vivo is outside the body, but the tissue is still fresh and alive. And you found out the fluorescence you know, signals there as well. So in this case, with the massive tumor in the lung through the open chest surgery, of course, it's easy to identify where the tumor is located. So the advantage of our technology is really to map out the residue tumors to make sure nothing is left behind, okay? And also to identify any of the uh, lymph nodes that might have tumor deposits or metastases. So in that case, you need to remove the lymph nodes. And another example is also in lung tumor, open chest. And in this case that there's no primary or main tumor, it's all scattered around, okay? You can see that if you take the lung uh, tissue out, you do it ex vivo, and you can see that it's all kind of spotted, scattered. So in this case, it would be very difficult for, uh, 
to remove all of these spots completely without guidance. So in this case, our image guidance becomes very important so that you can pick on these kind of lights. Boom, 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 you get all of these things removed, okay? So, uh, of course, uh, you know, if you've watched some of these open chest surgery, you, you do have, you have a lot of respect for the surgeons, okay? But also you realize that that's not the way to go in the future, okay? And it's very traumatic. Uh, uh, it, it's a uh, very trauma, uh, tra uh, kind of uh, 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 harmful to open the chest completely and operate in this way. So the future is really a minimally invasive surgery, especially with endoscopic, okay, endoscopy and robots. The idea is that instead of uh, cut the chest open, you would uh, 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 make a few holes, okay? The surgeon is called portholes. Then you insert your camera imaging devices, the surgical tool, and the robotic arms all through this little kind of uh, 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 portholes, and then you can do this under minimally invasive conditions. And this is becoming really popular but a major problem, again, is actually uh, the guidance, okay, inside the body. And how do you know you're cutting, you can identify the lesions. It turned out that if you don't fracture the bone, you don't cut the major muscles. And the human body, especially the abdominal part, can take quite a bit of these kind of devices, okay. So see how many, this is already five. It's no problem. Okay, but the issue here is that uh, uh, now the surgeon uh, uh, has lost uh, the, the tactile, which is the haptic touch, cannot use his or her hands to feel the texture of the tissue, okay, and cannot see with his or her eyes directly. So it makes the identification uh, and uh, of the tumor a lot harder. So in this case, it's, it becomes much more essential that you do need a uh, guidance, optical navigation guidance in the system. For example, this is again in the lung. Okay, if you look at the bright field, now well, it looks roughly the same. So these are the ribs, and these are the lungs. However, if you inject the tracers, as we discussed, okay, that get accumulated in the lung, in the tumor, and immediately you know the tumor is right here. Yeah. And the surgeon can make a cut, and after they cut this, then they can look at this again to make sure if everything has been uh, resected, okay? So, uh, you know, in uh, uh, the last few minutes, I want to uh, you know, describe some of the futures of surgery. I, actually, I'm teaching a course in surgical robotic, robotic technologies in bioengineering at the University of Illinois. I believe this is the only course, okay, such course in the country. So uh, robotic technologies is becoming, for uh, surgery, becoming really uh, popular. The idea is that you, you use the robots operating on the patient, whereas the surgeon operating at a console. The, uh, uh, the, the concept was actually developed by uh, the military because they, they worry that if you have a submarine when a, a soldier needs surgery under the ocean in the submarine, who is going to be able to operate that? So in this case, the surgeon could be in New York City and the patient could be in Los Angeles, okay? Or the surgeon could be in Chicago and the patient could be in Atlanta. You can operate this all through the internet. I, I think this is one of the major expected applications for 5G. You will need a lot of uh, visual you know, information in real time without latency, without lagging. Okay? So and you can see that the robotic arms can really rotate many ways, much more accurately than human hands. And the robotic arms never shake, unlike the, the human hands, okay? So, you know, the a surgeon operates on this. It could be anywhere in the room, in another city, 
Okay, and you know, uh, mechanically, uh, in terms of uh, precision, in terms of accuracy, reproducibility, the uh, uh, robotic arms are much better. But again, it's always the judgment, the human judgment. I ask some of the senior surgeons, uh, say, why you paid so much? They say it's because their judgment. It's not because their hands are getting better with age. It's because that they develop their judgment. So therefore, ultimately, it's still the judgment. Okay. However, if we use optical imaging, use you know some of the uh, artificial intelligence or virtual reality, augmented reality, to help the surgeon make decisions, to help that judgment process. I think that would be a really big deal. Okay, this is the Da Vinci robotic surgical system by Intuitive Surgical, okay? So if we have bought Intuitive Surgical stocks a few years ago, you probably are doing pretty well. You can, you can go ahead and uh, check uh, the stock price of Intuitive Surgical. I think it's, it's not too far away from $1,000 per share. Okay, this is the dominant okay, a robotic uh, surgery company in the world. Okay, they have a monopoly now. However, um, major companies like Johnson & Johnson, Medtronic, Stryker, all getting into the field. One of the uh, fascinating development recently is the flexible robots. It's robotic endoscopy. Okay, meaning that you have a snake-like robots which can navigate by itself through the body, like kind of very scary. Okay, this is the case of the lung. All of these kind of uh, channels in the lung is very much like a, a self-propelled snake can navigate these channels in the body and take biopsies and uh, perform surgeries. It's really fascinating work. And this was developed by a company in California called uh, Aurus Health. Okay, it's A U R I S, and then was bought by Johnson and Johnson Aurus Health. Okay, they developed this robotic bronchoscopy. Uh, it's very much like a, a computer game. You you use a, uh, uh, a joystick, you use a console to control that uh, you know uh, self-propelled robot and navigate through the body, okay, especially through the lung. And uh, Johnson and Johnson, I believe, paid something like uh, four or five billion dollars. It's not million, four or five billion dollars for such a thing like this. Okay. And uh, the Google Glass for surgery. So now we are uh, uh, combining information technology. Okay. So I often say to my students that uh, during our lifetime, the two major opportunities are digital trans transformation and the other is the medical innovation. So if you can combine digital transformation with medical innovation, you think about it, I think uh, the future is really limitless. So, you know, Google Glass for surgery already being developed. This is especially going to be important for virtual reality and augmented reality uh, for surgery. And, uh, you know, the other day I was hiking here in Illinois and uh, I finally found a way to explain what is augmented reality. You know, on my iPhone, there's an app called Sky View. So if you look at Sky View toward the south, okay, and you see the trees and you don't even see the stars. You know, even you see the stars, you don't know what those kind of stars are. But when I turn on the sky view, immediately I see Saturn with the, uh, the, the ring. I see, uh, uh, what's, uh, what's this one? It's uh, uh, Jupiter. Jupiter, that's right, like Jupiter, okay? So essentially you're superimposing the, uh, 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 the the the, the uh, information you know, previously reported on this field of view. Okay, so this is exactly the same when you apply the 
the medical imaging data, the diagnostic imaging, the CTs, MRIs, in the surgical field of view. Okay, so and you can see that it can even uh, would guide you. Suppose if you want to do space travel, you can certainly uh, use this as a guide. Okay, so now it's the augmented reality in liver surgery. So you open up this abdominal part, you see the liver. It's it's really complicated. It's a mess. However, you even use the iPad here. You load kind of sky view uh, software, and that going to tell you what these kind of things are. Okay. So the idea of this is that uh, before surgery, of course, you have to do MRI, do CT, and do PET, and all kind of diagnostic imaging, you will construct a digital three-dimensional anatomy of the normal tissue and the, the lesion, the nerves, the blood vessel. So that will be already stored in a computer somewhere in a data center, okay? So when you do surgery, you have the intraoperative field of view, and then automatically through the cloud and all of that anatomical information going to superimpose in your field of view. Okay, so let's say another example, this is the planning. Okay, you're looking at the liver. Okay, you just need to wear that goggle. Okay? And uh, see, uh, those are the, the blood vessels, the vasculatures in the, uh, in the liver. And you know this would be the uh, augmented reality guided robotic assisted surgery. Okay, so uh, you do this uh, 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 under minimally invasive conditions, and uh, you can use the the uh, the software, the pre-recorded you know database to guide you. And uh, again, this is the AR and virtual reality uh, mixed reality first. Uh, for surgery, you can have the anatomy of heart, anatomy of the brain, and all displayed in the field of view. Okay, so you can see what's behind because the uh, human uh, vision can only see what's on the surface. Okay? But this kind of uh, augmented reality can allow you to see what is behind. They, uh, people call this the see through technology. Okay, so uh, let me summarize very quickly. Uh, you know, uh, essentially there are several components in, in developing uh, new technologies for uh, cancer surgery. It, it needs the uh, hardware device, it needs the software. I, I think this is going to be very exciting, especially many HRIs devices for robotic and minimally invasive surgery, and uh, even integrated systems for imaging surgery and therapy. It can be low cost, or people think about the disposable, single-use, wireless, you know, Wi-Fi, 5G, all of these kind of things. I, I, I think uh, tremendously exciting. And really the hard part, the, 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 the challenge in this field is really the contrast agent or the tracers. The agents that uh, you inject into the body to highlight the tumors or highlight the nerves, highlight the blood vessels, okay? So there has to be a way you can highlight the tissues, the organs, before you can develop the, the, the map, the color map for surgery. Okay, so uh, let, me, let me conclude that, that you know, the future is engineering for image-guided robotic surgery is really the robotic, endoscopic, and minimally invasive surgery with intelligent photonic guidance plus the uh, uh, augmented reality, the uh, virtual reality, and the artificial intelligence the software. So, and of course, the 5G uh, might make all of this possible for transmitting images, you know, data uh, you know, instantaneously and so fast that the surgeons can perform you know, surgery uh, in different cities and even uh, you know, in, you know, in different countries. Okay. So uh, you know, it's, it's easy for me to talk about this, but actually 
it's the work of uh, uh, of many people, both at Emory University at Georgia Tech, at uh, at uh, uh, UPenn and Mount Sinai, and also of course now at University of Illinois, and also you know it. It's very expensive. Uh, it, these kind of medical research related to new technology, uh, we probably spend at least uh, fifty million dollars. I, I was at Emory University to develop some of the technologies, uh, but I like to especially acknowledge uh, the collaborators, Doctor uh, Dr. Single. He's the thoracic surgeon. And David Kuby. He's the GI surgeon. And Andrew Young is the pathologist. Uh, James Provenzali is the neuro uh, radiologist. Costa Hadjapanias is the uh, neurosurgeon, and uh, also uh, you know Mei Wen is a professor uh, at Georgia Tech, a software engineer, and, and also my 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 wife, and she certainly played a major role in developing some of these uh, technologies for uh, cancer imaging, especially on the data and on the software side. So uh, with that, I, I'd like to thank Steve and, and, and Roger for the opportunity, and certainly being, uh, it's been a pleasure to share some of our excitement in the work with the Georgia professional engineers. I'd be happy to take any, any questions that you might have. All right, thank you. And while uh, we're waiting to see if anybody else has any more questions that they'd like to type in, I, I have a question for you. Yes. Yes, um, what do you think the chances are of using this type of technology uh, to leverage uh, into the future to instead of highlighting and, and assisting the surgeons and so on, but to actually make it to where um, the agents and the, and the nanotech can destroy the tumors uh, basically on its own or under guidance from a surgery without having to open the patient at all. Do you think that's possible? Yes, that's definitely possible. So uh, the minimally invasive procedures, well, you, you need something, okay? It's minimally invasive. It's still a little bit invasive because it's a surgical procedure and even endoscopic procedures like colonoscopy and uh, when you have a polyp it's still a kind of a clipping you have to remove that it's minimally uh, 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 invasive it, it cannot be completely non-invasive so and that's no problem so we, we're going to develop some of the smart agents you know smart procedures that can destroy some of the tumors or lesions automatically. Uh, but on the other hand, there's another level of the question is whether you have to evolve the surgeons. It's like autonomous uh, vehicles, okay? You don't involve the drivers. And uh, well, you know, we we're thinking about maybe that you can program everything into the computer, into the system. So when the patient put it on the table and the a machine going to automatically complete the surgery. Well, that's probably, you know, that's that's much more involved than driving, okay? So, so that's probably going to take a long, long time. And at this time, all of these technologies uh, are to assist the surgeon making a better judgment and do certain procedures, verify certain things. Okay, thanks. Uh, let's see. Uh, this is more of uh, just a comment, it looks like. Uh, uh, John Hogan says, exciting presentation. I've heard bits here and there of some of these elements, but never rolled up into such great detail firsthand. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jim Remick uh, is asking, would remote distance with latency be a problem to the surgery procedure? Well, that's, uh, yes, uh, that, that's, uh, you know, one of the uh, major expected applications of 5G is to uh, speed up the uh, transmission speed and uh, minimize latency because in, in surgical procedures, 
it's a huge amount of data you have to uh, transmit. Very high resolution color images, and you don't need a, you don't want a lag because some of the cutting procedures can happen very quickly. So uh, you know, you know Samsung and some of these big companies, they 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 say that that uh, the uh, 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 robotic surgery is one of the key applications of 5G. Okay. Yeah, it looks like we got another one. Uh, with remote robotic surgery, do you require a standby surgeon at the actual surgery site to deal with unintended events? Well, at this time, yes. So uh, my uh, thoracic surgeon collaborator, Sunil Single, is that uh, you know, uh, if the robotic surgery does not work out, he immediately convert that into a manual open surgery. So, so, but in the future, okay, you see that uh, the de Department of Defense, the vision is not to have a surgeon attending the patient at the remote site. Okay, so in a submarine or in a battlefield, someone needs uh, immediate surgery, there's no surgeon Iran. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so I think at this time, uh, it, the procedures are still performed uh, in hospitals. Okay, and in the future, I, I think that you know, for some of the standard, you know, relatively simple procedures, we may not need a attending surgeon. But at this time, we. Okay. Let's see. Anybody else? All right. Well, I think that's it. Uh, thank you, everybody, for your questions and, and comments and so on. And uh, thank you again, Shuming, for a great presentation. Uh, I, for one, certainly found it very informative. Uh, we, we talk occasionally about uh, some of the work you do and so on, but I've uh, never gotten it quite in depth myself. So thank you very much. Well, look at the intuitive surgical. You may make uh, some money by doing <laughs> <laughs> it for the $1,000 per year. There you go. Okay. Let's see. Oh, we've got one more just came in. Uh, let's see here. Our, from Tom Williams, are applications being recognized where this will enable surgeries that are presently considered inoperable? Good question. Uh, well, that's an interesting question. So, so operable or inoperable, which is a medical term, actually. <laughs> so if, if, for example, in uh, oncology, if a tumor already spread metastasized to multiple sites, it's considered to be inoperable because you know, surgery won't help the patient. Okay? Uh, but there may be other cases okay, uh, where the, uh, the patient, the, 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 the the surgeons could not access, and you know, some of these many HRIs and devices might be able to go in. Okay. And I should say that the experienced surgeons, the senior surgeons, often argue that uh, the robots don't do anything better. Okay. <laughs> the robots are not any better. They can the, the, the senior surgeons can do as just as well as the robots. Okay. Uh, you know, but again, uh, how many patients they can do? They can do one or two patients, okay? And they charge a lot of money. It's very expensive. So if the robots can do as well as the senior surgeons, I would say that's pretty darn good. <laughs> so any of the inoperable procedures might be made uh, amenable to surgery. I, I don't know. I, I actually don't have a clear answer yet. Okay. All right. It looks like we got another one. This one from Roger Grabman. Uh, these techniques rely in the target being on the surface. What is possible for subsurface? Well, Roger, uh, this is this is a, a penetrating question, and we've been discussing working on this for the last uh, ten years. So all of these optical techniques, photonic-based technologies have a common limitation, which is the limited penetration depth into the tissue, uh, as we all know. So 
the good thing is that a lot of the, the tumors are epithelial. Epithelial meaning that they are on the surface, okay? So, uh, the, but some of them are indeed buried deeper. And that's still a major problem. We cannot see those. Okay. So for that reason, uh, it would be important either to make the optical photonic imaging technologies can see deeper or use those uh, augmented reality. So to make the uh, 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 deeply buried tumors, you know, visible, okay, essentially, uh, kind of like a see-through technology, okay? Even though you only see on the surface, but you know what is behind. Okay, there's tremendous effort in doing that, uh, but, but that that is still a, a, a major challenge for the entire field. Okay. All right, I think that wraps it up. Okay, we're exactly on time. Thank you. Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll see you soon.